So um, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, integrating whole genome sequence across studies for association analysis. So this is going to really be about trying to detect uh, genotype phenotype correlations um, and trying to capitalize on this idea that there's a lot of whole genome sequence out there and um, you know we all like to form consortia and how to answer these questions about genotype phenotype correlations but we need a lot of data and how can we integrate that data and what are some of the challenges. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the motivation of this problem. So um, whole genome sequencing studies are now allowing us to, um, you know, using next generation sequence data, are now allowing us to do genome-wide studies with both rare and common variants, whereas historically we've been using a lot of uh, uh, genome-wide microarrays and, um, and, and looking for common variation that's associated with disease. Um, and in, of course, in order to be able to, to, to carry this off, we need really large sample sizes. So we're looking at rare variants. Um, and um, whole genome sequence, of course, remains quite expensive. So um, it highlights the need to develop international consortia, um, to combine sequence across study, different studies, and even to use alternative study designs. So for example, we know that there's publicly available whole genome sequence data, like from the 1,000 genomes or 100,000, the UK 100,000 project, or there are many various um, public data out there. Um, and also other individuals are looking at um, other, um, other approaches like using low-pass sequencing um, it's, um, to try to, on large samples of individuals. So there's various um, different ways people are trying to start to think about um, uh, new designs uh, capitalizing on whole genome sequence. Um, so it would be great to be able to use all of this data and put it together, but there are several factors that could bias genotype phenotype association studies when you combine sequence from different experimental designs. Um, and this includes combining many different um, groups of individuals, say if, if we were wanting to, to look at height, try to find genotype phenotype correlations, association studies for height, and we wanted to, you know, many studies have um, collected height information. We should be able to get that information from um, all kinds of different study groups with whole genome sequence. Um, but there are, you know, there are sources of bias that we have to consider. Or, for example, many individuals, many investigators, perhaps are just sequencing their cases. Um, and they are looking for whole, nobody wants to put money into sequencing control groups. So they end up um, often having a bunch of cases who are sequenced and asking the question, how, how do I do genotype phenotype association if I don't have any sequence on controls? And so it would be nice to be able to use public controls. Now the types of bias that can come into these genotype phenotype association studies when we're combining sequence across different groups can be broadly divided into two sources. Um, one is our study design consideration. So for example, you can imagine if you take a, a control group from, from uh, one study and a case group from another study, then there could be confounders because they're not similar on factors like ethnicity, for example. So um, these are what I call study design considerations. We're not going to talk about that here. We're going to make the assumption that when we get a control group or we're combining individuals, that they are matched in some way um, by their background. And then the other factors are related to the sequencing technology and the parameters themselves, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Okay, so, so factors that are related to sequencing technology and the parameters. So for example, um, you could be using different um, sequencing platforms. Um, different alignment algorithms or reference genomes. Um, you could have different sequencing parameters. For example, one, the case group, you might have sequenced at 30x or 100x, whereas you're grabbing a control group and they're sequenced at 7x or 10x. Um, and then, of course, there's a SNP detection and genotype ca um, calling algorithms, and these might differ as well across um, different sequence that you obtain from um, different groups. Okay, so this is a, an old, a little bit of an older paper uh, from 2012, where Quayle um, 
um, looks at, for example, sequencing on the Illumina High Seq versus on the um, Ion Torrent, um, and just to just to sort of concept, to make this uh, more concrete, um, for example, the sequencing platforms could have um, different error rates, um, and you know from the sequencing data you get the raw read and a base quality, um, and then you you map and you align. <coughs> reads to a reference genome, you're going to get the aligned reads with a map quality score. And then you take them and um, you, do, you use, say, something like uh, SAM tools or GATK, and you get, SNP, you get the um, variant calls. Um, and you can also get genotype probabilities at this point, and, um, and the uh, SNPs and indel calls. So these would come from, say, uh, come in a format like a VCF file with the genotype calls and the genotype probabilities. And you can see that um, at various stages in this sort of pipeline, um, different, they can differ in different ways. Okay, so keeping that in mind, the general approach often, well, often to do genotype phenotype associations, for example, is one could you say for a case control study logistic regression, right? Could use a score test for logistic regression. So we're here, y is phenotype, so one equals case, zero is control. GIJ is the genotype information for sample I at the jth variant. And then to find out whether the genotype is associated with some phenotype, you would just use the log of of uh, pi i, right? And is, that's equal to that linear predictor, beta naught plus beta 1 g i. So you're testing the null hypothesis here that there's an association between the variant here um, and the phenotype. Okay, so this is just you know, a standard logistic regression model. And what's nice is you can, you can get the score statistic from this model that tests the null hypothesis that this beta 1 is equal to 0, and that's so what you're doing is you're testing whether there's an association between the variant and the outcome. And it has this very nice form, the sum of y of the sum over n, which is all of the individuals, yi minus y bar gi. And um, this actually, this score test statistic is a, a, a often is a, is a commonly used test statistic in genome-wide association studies, and has a very similar form, whether you're doing logistic regression or whether you're doing um, linear regression. So it's a very convenient test statistic to use, and that's why it's often used. So the corresponding um, score test statistic just takes this score statistic, squares it, and divides it by its variance. And then you can imagine, I'm sure lots of people have seen Manhattan plots, where you would just plot the p-values from these score statistics across the genome. OK, but the problem is, is that there are systematic dif when there are systematic differences in something like read depth, okay, so if all of the cases are sequenced at 30x and the controls are sequenced at, say, 7 or 8x, um, then these systematic differences in read depth can affect the type 1 error, the number of spurious results, okay? And this is mostly due to sort of a differential misclassification of the rare homozygote. So here is a very simple example where we take um, one sample of exome data on 56 individuals. This is from the Thousand Genomes Project. So we're just downloading data from the Thousand Genomes Project, the exome data, okay? So there's 56 individuals at 50x, and then we'll call that the case sample. And then the control sample consists of 113 individuals sequenced at low read depth, okay? So about 6.5x. And this is just chromosome 11, and we're just here now looking at the minor allele frequency variance greater than 5%. This is just single SNP analysis. And this is a standard QQ plot. So if the test statistic is correct, if there's no bias, then what you would expect to see is the, all the little dots on the identity line. Okay, this is the QQ plot. So observed uh, by expected. And we're gonna look at a lot of these plots. And what you can see, I just want you to pay attention to the black set. Because if you were to just use that score statistic like we do in regular uh, logistic regression, looking at whether the genotype is associated with the response, you see that it deviates from that identity line, showing that there's some association here. 
Well, we're only downloading those individuals who have high read depth versus those individuals who have low read depth. So this is completely under the null. There's no difference between those individuals. So what you're seeing here is spurious association due to read depth bias. Okay, so we want to be able to control for this. If you're bringing in sequence from all kinds of different sources, you have to make sure that you somehow control for this. So what I'm going to talk about today is this statistic that we call RBS, where we make an adjustment so that we can adjust for this read depth bias. And I'm going to talk, talk to you about what that RBS is. And you can see that we, we get back to the identity line. So there's, we're adjusting for this bias, and we're not observing spurious association. OK. So I, I gave away what I'm going to talk about today, and that is the development of this RBS statistic. But what if other, we're not the first people to have noticed that you're going to get bias from read depth um, differences. So, I mean, there have been other, other methodologies out there that have tried to deal with this issue. One is, is to just sequence cases for variant discovery and then go ahead and genotype cases and controls to look for frequency differences. But of course, um, you're not going to be able to detect protective variants that way. Um, and this is quite a conservative approach. Um, another approach is to actually try to adjust for read depth by weighting variants by their quality scores. Um, but if, you know, if the cases and controls are completely distinguishable by read depth, for example, then a method like this doesn't work at all. Um, and then actually in the GATK toolkit, um, there's, um, there's an option to randomly downsample the BAM files. So kind of throw out them to make if you have a 30x and a, and a 7x, then to make both 7x. Well, I mean, obviously, you're not using all of your data that way, so that's not an optimal solution. So I'm going to just go over the derivation of, of, of our proposal. And what, we're, what we are doing is we're repurposing and extending an approach that was published in Genetic Epidemiology in 2012 that incorporates genotype uncertainty into the association score test by using the genotype likelihoods. Okay, so that's a mouthful, but really the idea is that why are we using genotype calls from sequence data? We should be, we have read data, we have read level data. And so why wouldn't we incorporate that read level data into the association test? And that would, that would get at the uncertainty that we have already in the genotype calls instead of jumping right into, the, into using the genotype calls. And so an approach like this can, um, in comparison to just using the genotype calls, right? There's a, you know, it, it's all about going back further into the amount of, you know, to the level of raw data that you want to be able to use. So in this case, instead of, instead of letting some um, variant caller call the genotypes from the reads, we're going to go back a step and use those genotype likelihoods that actually incorporate the variation um, in the uh, genotype calls. Okay, so recall that score statistic that I, I just told, just talked about, about the score statistic for association analysis, very easy score statistic, and then the test that we use just takes the score statistic, squares it, and divides it by the variance. So remember this here, and this is the genotype call, right here, GI. Um, okay, so the difference now is if you want to be able to incorporate the read level, the read level uncertainty, okay, here's just a little notation that we're going to need. The DIJs are the sequence data, and the GIJ are the unobserved genotypes. Okay, so instead of basing a model on the called genotypes, we're going to use a joint model of the reads and the phenotype, okay, for I equals 1 to N individuals. And that can actually be written like this, where here we have um, the probability of disease given the genotype, which is just exactly like that logistic regression model that we had before, right? So this is just the, the um, disease model here. And uh, this term here um, is actually, can be written as a function of the genotype likelihoods that come out of these VCF files that are capturing that uncertainty in the read depth. Um, and so the only difference with the score test now from before is instead of a G being here, we have the expected 
genotype given the reads. Okay, so we're just replacing the genotype with the expected genotypes given the reads. And to calculate the expected genotypes given the reads, we just sum over the three possible genotypes here for biallelic variant times the probability of the genotype given DIJ. And that's solved by um, just this application of probability, probability laws where probability of DIJ, the probability of the reads given the genotype is the genotype likelihood that we're getting out of the VCF file. And the probability of GIJ in the numerator for that is just a genotype frequency. So all of these components are actually just output of a standard VCF file, which is very convenient, okay? So the genotype likelihood is exactly what I said, <coughs> PDIJ given GIJ is calculated from all the sample reads, and it is standard output of a genotype calling package. Um, and then the genotype frequencies are calculated from the full sample, also come out of the package. So really all we need to do now is calculate the variance of that score statistic, which basically is equivalent to calculating the variance of expected GIJ given DIJ. And that's, the, that's actually um, the challenge. So the variance of GIJ, the variance of the genotypes, just by using the law of total variance, can be expanded in this form. It's not so important that you understand the um, specifics of the expansion, but really just to take a look at this plot. So on this axis here, we have read depth. And on this axis, we have the difference between the variance of the genotypes, which is <clears throat> um, the, the variance that would, we would use in a regular score statistic, minus the variance of the expected GIJ given DIJ. So it's sort of a measure of the bias in the variance. And what you can see here is that um, the variance of that score statistic, the variance of expected GIJ, is read depth dependent as well. So the whole point here is that you're going to incorporate genotype uncertainty in your new association test when you're combining sequence of different read depths, but you also need to account for read depth in your variance estimation. Okay, and if you don't, what you can see here is, here's an expansion of the variance term, and what you can see here in this expansion of the variance term is, imagine you have a very large sample size of controls that you got from <coughs> public data, okay, that are very low read depth. And then you have the variance of the cases, and you have the cases who are at very high read depth. So their variability is going to be small, but highly weighted because the sample size of the control group is so high. So most of, unless you incorporate the variability in the, different, the two different groups properly in that variance estimation, you're going to underestimate the variance and you get those spurious association signals, which is why it was all sitting off of that line in the QQ plot. So the key here is to, to estimate the variance separately in the, two, in the two groups or three groups or however many groups that you're combining of sequence data, estimate their variance of their score statistics separately. If you do that, then you should get valid inference. You won't get any spurious results and you adjust for read depth bias. Okay. So, so that, that, that's the extent of the, the derivation for the test statistic and I'm going to start to show you um, a little bit about, a little bit about of, of the application. So here, what we're going to do now is a, we're going we're to do a score, we're going to show you how we do a score test for single SNP analysis as well as for joint analysis of rare variants. So I told you with whole genome sequence, we know we can, we can analyze single variants that are common, but we can also analyze rare variants now. We're gonna, we have them with the whole genome sequence. Um, so for joint analysis of, of rare variants, um, we use standard rare variant analysis tools. Um, so these are our our test statistics. I don't know if any of you have heard of SCAT or CAST or C alpha. These are basically just um, rare variant test statistics that um, combine rare variants in a region by say, the simplest one would be a test called CAST, which is here, I'll show you some results for that, where they just take, let's say, a bunch of variants in a region and they're rare, so the test statistic just 
um, sums over the number of rare <coughs> variants that you observe in you know, a stretch of, of DNA. Okay, so that would be the simplest rare variant um, test statistic. Um, and so in order to, to, to do the rare variant analysis, we use some of these combining test statistics here, this cast, and we <coughs> estimate the covariance matrix for, um, for the vector of those variants separately in cases and controls. And then we're gonna, we evaluate the test statistic by an asymptotic distribution or by bootstrap resampling. So for, for common variants, we can just use the asymptotic test statistic. So I told you that that um, score test statistic um, is chi-squared one, that's the asymptotic distribution, so we can just use that very simple application of that and we can, we can compute quickly. Whereas if we have to do bootstrap resampling, then um, it's a, uh, we definitely have to do the bootstrap resampling for rare variants, and that is computationally quite expensive, as I'm going to show you. Um, just, just lastly, just to, just to highlight, I told you that that score test is very general. So it doesn't matter if we're doing cases or controls. We could also be doing height. We could have a quantitative trait, and the score test would look very similar, and the variance as well would look very similar. We'd have to divide up that variance and estimate it separately in all of the sequence, co sequence groups that we're combining. But the methodology is, is very simple and applicable to um, quantitative traits, to case control, to, in fact, um, any number of groups. Let's say we're in a big consortium and everybody sequenced their data, but they did it at different read depths. We can combine all the groups together as long as we divide up that variance estimation and estimate the different groups separately. Um, then there's no problem. We can do it and we're not going to get the read depth bias. Okay, so I'm just going to um, show you some of the results now using this test statistic. We call it the Robust Variance Score Test, RVS, and hopefully that's obvious now because we take the score test and, and we make the variance robust. So we call it the Robust Variance Score. Okay, so the first set of results I'm going to show are simulation just to assess power and type 1 error of the, of the approach. Um, the second, I'm going to show the RBS applied to the 1,000 genomes data, so exome data versus um, the low read depth whole genome data. Um, and then I'm going to show one last example um, in real data, some um, epilepsy cases, and uh, comparing them to public control data. Okay, so the simulation <laughs> Um, follows in the following way. So we're going to do, I'm going to have some single variant analysis, um, and this is under the null hypothesis, so I'm simulating as if there's no association, and we're going to use a minor allele frequency of 1%, 10%, 20%, 30%, and 40%. Um, also going to do a rare variant analysis. We're going to collapse those five variants in that test I told you about, that, that CAST test, the very simple collapsing test for rare variants. Um, and the variance in that test will be range in minor allele frequency from 0.1 to 5%. Then I'm also going to show some results about if we're not just combining two groups, a case control group, but if we're combining multiple groups, and you'll, you'll see what happens to the type 1 error when we do that. Um, in all of these simulations, we have 500 case, cases at 100x average depth with an error model for the um, sequence and 1,500 controls at 4x average read depth. Um, and so here we're just going to use that, I told you that CAST test, I'm not going to show you results with any of the other rare variant tests. Basically you get similar results in terms of controlling type 1 error and power, which is what we're interested in here. We don't want spurious results from just throwing sequence data together. Um, and then also going to look a little bit at the power, and we've created a situation where it's a rare variant analysis and all um, of the variants have a, a small odds ratio of 1.5. Okay, so here are the results, here are the QQ plots. So this is um, under the null hypothesis, so we want everything to be on the red line. So A corresponds to an allele frequency of point, a minor allele frequency of 0.01, B is 0.1, C is 0.2, and D is 0.4. And what we're comparing is are three different tests, okay? The green is RBS, it's the R adjusted test. The blue is the true genotype. So imagine you were in a situation where you had no, knew what the true genotypes were. 
you know them without error. So that would be the best case scenario. So we're always comparing that as our gold standard. And then the black is, um, is the like, we call it the likelihood method. So that's um, the method where, um, where it's, it, it, we're using the genotype uncertainty, but we're not adjusting for the variance differences. Okay, and you can see in every situation that um, RBS is getting pretty close to the true genotype situation, um, but that if you don't adjust for differential variance due to read depth, which is, is the black, you're going to see some inflation. Um, so here is uh, type 1 era and power, and we're always comparing to the true genotypes, so RBS compared to the true genotypes. So here we can see um, that um, and this is for a rare variant analysis. So this is now not a common situation, but when we're collapsing variants and trying to do rare variant analysis. And what you can see here is that RBS and the true genotypes, that RBS is performing almost as well as if you knew the true genotypes, which is great. And then um, in terms of empirical power, you can see um, for different levels of the test. So now we're, we're generating um, variants that have an odds ratio, five variants, they each have an odds ratio of 1.5. We're collapsing them together in a rare variant test statistic. Um, and, and you can see here, we're looking at different levels of the test, whether we call it significant at 0.05, you know, 0.01, these different levels of significance. And what you can see is that RVS is never as powerful as if you had the true genotypes, but it does pretty well. Okay, um, now the last simulation scenario we wanted to look at is, is some, some new results. Um, and and, and uh, that has to do with combining, we want to start to generalize the number of groups that we combine. So into this idea of big international consortium, let's add three groups together, four groups, five, six groups, let's, and let's see how the different methods um, perform. We want to make sure that we don't have redepth bias, which means we don't have spurious results. So we want to be able to control the type 1 error rate below 0.05. There's some variation here because of simulation. We didn't do a ton of, of replicates. It gets better as we do some more replicates. Um, but you see here, of course, the true genotype is, is uh, well controlled, if not a little bit conservative. RVS is well as well controlled, um, but we have some inflation here. Um, but, but we can easily, I think the point here is that we can easily accommodate um, you know, many different groups, combining many different groups using that same test statistic, which is great. Um, okay, so, so the next, the next um, idea we wanted to take a look at was to use the thousand genomes data. So we have the um, thousand, we just use the thousand genomes project data phase three release. We use the, um, the uh, European subsets. We have one sample of exome data on 56 individuals at 50x. And then the second sample is the 113 individuals at low read depth 6.5x. And this is the same data I showed you earlier on in the talk. And so this we downloaded chromosome 11, the aligned chromosome 11 reads. And we used GATK on the combined sample, so the exome and, um, and um, low read genome samples. So we create a combined um, sample of the aligned read and generate a multi-sample BCF file. So we standardized those, those ideas in the pipeline. Um, and then we apply some common filters. We extract the genotype calls and the genotype likelihoods from the BCF file. And then we compared RBS to a score test using the genotype calls from the BCF file. OK, so this is that plot I showed you earlier on now. But now you know a little bit more about RBS. So you can see now comparing the 1,000 genomes exome, so high read depth, to Low, to uh, low read depth that you have um, quite a bit of inflation here if you were to use the genotype calls, but the RBS does a nice job of controlling that inflation, and that's, you know, quite a difference in um, read depth. And here, same data, but now we're looking at using that rare variant test. So these are for variants with minor allele frequency less than 5%. And here you start to see a lot of inflation in the genotype calls here off the line 
Okay, so in both cases, you're, we're analyzing the same number of variants, the same variants, um, but you see um, quite a bit of inflation if you were to use the genotype calls for rare variant analysis, whereas in that it sits nicely on the line, um, on the identity line for RBS. So we're able to, to, to really adjust away that read depth bias in the 1,000 genomes data. Okay, so the last example is a, a real data example. So, um, so this was, um, we had 27 European individuals with Rolandic epilepsy and they were sequenced, this was many years ago, at 197X um, um, in a 600 KB region of chromosome 11. And this actually was one of the real motivators because I had an investigator come to me and he was very excited with all this new next generation sequencing methodology was, um, and, but he sequenced the cases and he had no controls. So, um, so we decided, well, how, you know, we needed to develop some methodology that would enable us to use some of the public control data out there or, or you use other data. So we compare it to, here we're going to compare that whole genome, see that the epilepsy cases to 113 whole genome controls from 1,000 genomes. So, that's like some of the data in the last example. So we generate a multi-sample BCF file on the combined set with GATK, so the 27 RE cases and the 113,000 genomes controls. Again, we apply the same common filters, we extract the genotype calls and the genotype likelihoods, and then we compare RVS to an analysis with genotype calls where we were able to get um, high read depth controls from a collaborator uh, 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 who sequenced some cancer cases using complete genomics. So we thought comparing two high read depth samples, well, we shouldn't have read depth bias. So that was the comparison. And, and really the take home message here is, in this column here, um, is the thousand, these are the uh, association P values for um, the, the SNPs in the first column. And uh, the last column here is RBS, with the Rolandic epilepsy cases versus 1,000 genomes of control. And the second to last column is the p-value using genotype calls from the, um, the Rolandic epilepsy cases and the complete genomics high read depth controls. And what's, what's nice to see here is that you know, the top four or five variants are all um, you know, very similar between the two approaches. Okay, so we developed an R package to make this methodology available. Um, what was very funny about that was, you know, we're statisticians and so that's what we do. We, we develop R packages and then um, we were contacted by um, some people at the Sanger who just published a paper in Nature Genetics who used RBS. Um, and they said, yeah, you, that was a really cute statistic and thank you very much. Um, and we had, to, um, we had to write a C package so we could use it on our 8,000. Um, patients who were se sequenced um, at low read depth. So the R package really didn't scale up, so, uh, so Scott joined our team to translate that to a C++ package. Um, so we're hoping uh, now we're going to get, uh, we're going to be able to handle some of those really large data sets. Um, this is just the workflow for RBS, which hopefully you got now. You match the high read depth and low read depth um, sets based on external factors, you align to a common reference genome, you combine the sample variant calling from BAM files to produce this combined BCF file, and then um, you're going you're gonna to get the genotype likelihoods and the genotype probabilities from the BCF file, and depending on whether you're going to do a rare variant test or a common variant test, you call those functions in the package. Um, we thought this was nice. Scott produced these just comparing um, the speed of the R package versus the C++ package. So here is a common variant association analysis. So you know it's obviously a function of a number of bootstrap iterations you have to do to compute the p-value. But what was taking 1.4 seconds in our R package was taking 0.016 seconds in the C++ package. So. So that will make it much more useful. Sort of similar metrics that we're seeing for the rare variant association test where the bootstrap iterations are really important. So <clears throat> 0.09 seconds and our 0.014 seconds um, in the C++ package. 
So just in conclusion, um, the score tests based on genotype calls or likelihoods have inflated type 1 errors when groups have different numbers of read depth. So if you're going to combine sequence across different platforms um, from all, different collaborators, just be mindful that um, it can induce a read depth bias. And, and we're seeing a lot of this now, especially at TCAG in the facility, where people are coming and, and they're seeing a lot of spurious association signals because they're grabbing sequence from anywhere and just kind of putting it together. So the RBS allows us to incorporate all of these EBA study groups into um, our NGS association studies, assuming we're matching on other factors. So I mean, we still need good study designs. Um, we can use it for single or, or rare variant analysis. And right now, um, the group is, is extending it to accommodate covariate adjustment. And we're also creating power tools. So we want to be able to say, OK, well, what if I were to use 1,000 out of study controls at low read depth, and I do a few controls in my own sample and a few cases? What kind of power would that be versus cost benefit? So we're creating some tools now to be able to do that as well with our simulator. Um, and of course, there's the speed. So you can find the package on the TCAG website or on my website. And here are some of the um, references for the work. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the people who, who did all the work. So um, Andre Durkacz, he was a PhD student in the stats department. He's now at the um, NIH doing a postdoc. Um, and he, he came up with the, uh, with the development of, of the original um, RVS idea. Um, <clears throat> so Jai Fan wrote the, she's a, a, a biostatistician in my group, and she wrote the R package. Zainab is a postdoc. She did a P her PhD is in statistics from, from here, from the University of Toronto, and she is working on all the extensions and, and deriving those robust variance estimates for all kinds of different outcomes and the power tools. And then there's Scott, and uh, Scott is helping us to translate it into something that, that the community can, can use when they're scaling up their sequence. Um, and thanks to our funders and to all the people who actually gave us some of that real data. So thank you very much. to a certain read depth, like I noticed as a comparison you were comparing 197 with 36x, yeah. and at that level? So yeah, so if you start to compare high read depth to high read depth, it does, it does go away, um, and I mean because your allele frequency, the problem is the allele frequency estimates, you know, they're biased, so. Um, however, you know, these read depth estimates are global, right? So you can't predict at any one given location that you're going to have high read depth in both groups. So, and you're not going to look across the whole genome, right, at every single location where you do a test, although I guess yeah, you, you could post hoc look at associated regions or whatever, but yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's quite, it would be quite easy to just apply the robust adjustment here in general. You don't really lose anything, so why not? But yeah, that's true. And also you, you uh, the topic of focusing on read depth, but also alluded to problems uh, with different sequencing platforms and aligners, and, and um, this yeah. method smooths out those, those differences so, as well. So when the, when the effect of some of those differences translates to read depth differences, ah. then yes, right? And many of them do, actually. But, you know, um, there are some things that you can't, you, you can't adjust for. For example, if you're aligning to different references. I mean, you know, so that's why we tried to create that sort of uh, the pipeline where we said you want to match, you want to align to a common reference, you want to use the same variant colors, you know, you do it in the multi sample. So we're trying to control for a lot of those things in that way. But, yeah. I'm not a statistician, but I'm just curious about one question. Is the phenotype has to be clear? It has to be clear that in this case, of epilepsy. I mean, if somebody has a recessive gene, can you still see it with your with your statistics in there? So, so here we are studying epilepsy. Um, we also study something like cystic, we study cystic fibrosis, and it's a recessive disorder. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't 
it doesn't really matter what the trait is, you can use that, and that's the beauty of that score statistic itself, that it's very general for whether you want to study height or whether you want, I mean, it doesn't matter about the, about the form of the phenotype, so it, it, is, quite, it is quite general, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Could you do this, because well, I'm working with somebody that works on attention play fraud. Could you work with uh, what? Sorry. an attention point fraud? Oh, okay. Attention point. Yeah. Could you like so this you're doing this with diploid and a reference genome? It would just be more power you need, right? I don't um. know. <laughs> well, only because he's starting to look at uh, different effects. Yeah, I mean it's so so in that scenario it's just about how you code the uh, effect of the genotype on the trait. So okay. um, yeah, I'd have to think a little bit about this, but, but you could probably still use the score test. So that, that well, not that they have this much sequencing data, but, but, you know. but yeah, I mean, you probably. And then how much are you dealing with people that have had a poor study design that you come in and Yeah, a lot, a, a lot. Um, yeah, because it's so expensive to get whole genome sequence, right? So nobody wants to sequence controls, and everybody's talking about creating public repositories of control samples, right? So it's true that they're out there, but you can't use them blindly, I think is the take home message, yeah. right? So, yeah. That's why I always think it's good to, before you set up, come to you guys, and that's rare, but. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so is that it? Because uh, we're gonna have pizza later, and uh, Lisa will be there for questions, if you guys wanna stay. Uh, and now, Brad, let's get you started. We think we started that one. Thanks a lot, Lisa. No problem. Uh,